The night of May 25, 1996, was hot and sweltering in the California town of San Luis Obispo. The Polytechnic University campus, nestled in the picturesque hills, exuded the smells of youth, recklessness, and hard liquor. The Pi Kappa Alpha fraternity rattled off a birthday party for one of its campus sisters. Among the guests was Christine Sandy Smart, a pretty blonde girl with mischievous blue eyes and a stubborn chin. In her 26 years, she has managed to gain popularity at uni, thanks to her job as a lifeguard at the recreation center and her friendly, cheerful disposition. On this May night, Christine came to the party alone, without a group of friends, which was atypical for this sociable and cheerful nature. In the spacious fraternity house, music was blaring, alcoholic drinks were flowing, creating a full atmosphere of reckless student fun. Christine was thrilled to be caught up in this whirlwind of dancing, loud conversations, unrestrained laughter and flirting. The tight-fitting dress emphasized her slender figure, making her the object of close attention from her classmates. She lost count of the glasses she drank, surrendering to the euphoria and the feeling of celebration without limits. Toward two o'clock in the morning, the girl began to feel uneasy. She felt dizzy, her legs felt woozy, and the nauseating weight of overeating and overdrinking settled in her stomach. Christine decided she'd better go home to her cozy room in the Malu Towers dormitory. But going alone in such a drunken state was extremely risky at this late hour. Fortunately, on her way out of the frat house, she ran into some familiar faces, Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis, her classmates. They were also quite tipsy, but realized that Christine needed help right away. Hey, can you guys walk me back to my dorm? I don't feel so good, she moaned, leaning her shoulder against the door jamb. Cheryl and Tim looked at each other, silently agreeing to help her to a safe place. Nearby, they spotted another student who was also at the party, Paul Flores. He was stocky, with short, dark hair and a piercing, tenacious stare. Paul was also a little tipsy, but more or less on his feet. He gallantly offered to take Christine to her dormitory himself, for he lived very close by on the next block. Paul took the girl under his arm and led her slowly into the night, saying goodbye to Tim and Cheryl. They watched the silhouettes of their classmates walk away down the dark alley, perhaps seeing Christine alive for the last time. This scene seemed to warm the heart, a noble student helping his friend in her time of need. But no one suspected at the time that a blood-chilling tragedy would follow. The next morning, Christine never returned to her dorm room at Malu Towers. Her roommate, Margarita Campos, became seriously concerned. Christine's cell phone was unavailable. No one answered the loud knocks on the door from inside. And most importantly, all her belongings, including her passport, wallet, bank card, and documents, remained lying untouched at home. Margarita simply could not explain where her friend could easily go without the most basic things. The girl appealed to the police only 48 hours later, when Christine's absence began to feel just frightening. But law enforcement officers took the missing person's report very lightly and negligently. After all, the entire country had just celebrated Memorial Day, which honors American military personnel killed in wars. The cops assumed that the girl could just roll up for a couple days to her parents' house in another city, since it was a weekend. It was the first serious investigative error, opening a long line of omissions and criminal inaction. It was almost four days before Christine's parents in the distant town of Stockton received word of their daughter's disappearance. A worried Denise and Stan Smart immediately sounded the alarm at the local police, but even there they could not help them at first. Only then did the San Luis Obispo police began to make some progress. They called in Paul Flores, the last person who reportedly saw Christine alive the night of her mysterious disappearance. The night of her mysterious disappearance. The 19-year-old student could not tell anything clear, only said that he allegedly accompanied the drunk girl to the entrance to the hostile Malu Towers, after which she went to her own place, and he went away. However, this version was severely broken by the testimony of the neighbors on the block of the same Paul Flores. They claimed that the guy returned home only around 5 a.m., that is, almost three hours after he allegedly escorted Christine to the door of the dorm and said goodbye to her. Such a big time gap did not fit in the justification. But the most suspicious were the injuries on Paul Flores's face and legs. The guy confusingly explained their appearance, then a domestic quarrel with a neighbor, then a night street fight, 
then the consequences of a drunken fall somewhere. Three different versions from one man in a short period of time. Detectives immediately smelled something wrong, but they had no direct evidence to make an arrest. At the time, cell phones didn't have geolocation tracking. Fingerprints and other traces in the dorms or on campus were not seized and preserved in time. Nor was a forensic and canine search of Paul Flores' home conducted. Days passed, turning into weeks, and the investigation into the disappearance of Christine Smart hopelessly stalled. The girl's parents hired a private detective and announced a reward for any clue, but it was not enough. A month after the disappearance, police were forced to expand the search to Christine's hometown of Stockton, 350 miles away. The local media picked up the story and began running it on the front page every day, drawing parallels to the cult TV series Twin Peaks about the FBI's investigation into the murder of a schoolgirl in a fictional town. Newspaper and TV journalists began to build the most incredible versions, supplementing them with the revelations of all kinds of psychics and soothsayers. It came to the point that one of the clairvoyants claimed that Christine Smart was murdered by two unknown men on the campus, after which her corpse was allegedly taken to a high cliff and thrown into the water to hide the traces of the crime. Such delusional testimony, of course, did not inspire confidence in professional investigators. They still clung to Paul Flores as the main and perhaps the only suspect. But the young man stubbornly refused to make contact, citing the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which allows a suspect not to testify against himself. A year after Christine's disappearance, her parents filed a civil suit against Paul Flores, accusing him of involvement in their daughter's disappearance. A protracted trial began in 1997. Paul was forced to testify under oath while exercising his Fifth Amendment right not to answer most key questions. Paul's parents then filed a countersuit against the Smart family, alleging moral turpitude. The litigation dragged on for many months and ultimately came to nothing. The police had no direct evidence of Flores's guilt, and he refused to cooperate with the investigation. On May 25, 2002, Exactly six years after her disappearance, Christine Smart was officially declared dead by the court. Around the same time, rumors started circulating in the media that once Scott Peterson, a local pervert and serial killer who had served time for the massacre of another young woman, might be involved in her disappearance. This speculation was based only on the fact that as a student, Peterson had attended the same California Polytechnic University as Christine for a time. But after a brief investigation, police ruled out the jailbird's involvement in Smart's disappearance, and so flashed another 16 long years of utter hopelessness. During this time, there were several changes in the leadership of Christine's investigation team. Old employees retired or were transferred to other departments, and evidence and investigative threads were irretrievably lost and misplaced. Until in 2018, a California resident named Chris Lambert decided to record a series of his own podcasts on various unsolved crimes and criminal mysteries. Chris was only eight years old at the time of Christine Smart's disappearance in 1996, but he remembered the story well from daily media reports. So 22 years later, Lambert decided to conduct his own journalistic investigation into the details of that case. As he dived into the intricacies of the missing student's disappearance, Chris became horrified at how negligent and irresponsible law enforcement officers had been all these years. Lambert first decided to interview all available eyewitnesses and witnesses to the events of the May night in 1996. From students at California Polytechnic State University, he learned many forgotten and half-forgotten details. So, Paul Flores in those days had not the best reputation among his classmates. The guy was repeatedly accused of licentious behavior and obsessive solicitation of girls. Although no formal complaints were ever filed against Paul Flores, perhaps out of fear of retaliation or repercussions, Chris Lambert then analyzed all the actions of the investigators from the very beginning of the investigation and came to the conclusion that they made a number of critical errors and omissions. Detectives did not search Flores's home until two months after Christine Smart's disappearance. And at that point, 19-year-old Paul was still living with his parents, so police should have searched the home as one of the first emergency measures. But they didn't. And when the search did take place, 
it was conducted in an extremely shoddy and improper manner. The detectives did not involve either criminalists or experienced investigators, or even service dogs trained to pick up scent trails. Without this, the search was essentially a waste of time and resources. Another omission was the failure of the police to seize and inspect the family's two vehicles. In one of them, Paul Flores may well have driven Christine's body somewhere off campus if the murder theory is accepted. Subsequently, a few months after the cops' visit, one of the Flores' cars had been stolen and the other had been trivially sold to new owners. But the most glaring omission Lambert considered the fact that the house of Paul Flores' mother police never visited with a search during the investigation. But there could have been some important evidence, traces, or clues. Moreover, Chris found out some truly sinister details about Paul's mother's house. It turns out that four months after Christine's disappearance, the house was rented by a woman named Mary Laysider, and in one of the rooms she found an earring very similar to the jewelry that was on Christine on that fateful night of May 25, 1996. The same earrings were on a photograph of the missing girl that had been posted all over the campus at the time. Worried, Mary took the find to the police. And what do you think? At first, the cops refused to enter the earring as evidence in the disappearance case, and when they were forced to do so, they subsequently lost it. But Chris Lambert's shocking discoveries didn't stop there. It turned out that the entire backyard of Paul Flores' mother's house had always been perfectly poured concrete. However, around the same time that Christine went missing, some of the concrete was suddenly excavated and an earthen flower bed appeared there. Mary Laysider, who subsequently rented the house, told Lambert a truly sinister detail. For several weeks, she had heard a sound very similar to the alarm of an old electronic wristwatch every day at 4.20 in the morning and at 4.20 in the afternoon. Moreover, the sound was coming directly from the ground of the very same flower bed in her backyard. One day, the annoying beeping finally stopped. Perhaps the batteries in some old watch had run out, or maybe it had simply been dug up and removed from the ground along with the source of the sound. Chris Lambert decided to go to Christine Smart's mother with this sinister clue. And when he told the woman the story of the alarm clock, she was petrified with shock and dropped the picture of her daughter from her hands. Denise Smart struggled to gather her thoughts and replied, My Christine always set the reminder alarm for 4.20 a.m. She had to get up early to make it to work at the rec center at the university by 5 o'clock. When Chris Lambert's podcast with the results of his investigation went live in early 2019, the response was truly deafening. In a matter of weeks, the audio was listened to by more than 6 million people across the country. The public was shocked by the inaction and irresponsibility of the local police who had allowed Christine Smart's killer to walk free all these years. The new leads and evidence uncovered by reporter Lambert only served to increase people's outrage. As a result, the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Department was forced to revisit the case after 23 years and launch a new full-scale investigation. It was only now that investigators did their job properly. A thorough search was conducted at four locations at once, including Flores' home. Authorities announced the discovery of some evidence of interest to the investigation. However, on January 29, 2020, more specifics became known. Two vehicles belonging to Paul Flores were seized as potential exhibits in the reopened case. The most important accomplishment of the new investigative team was the excavation of the very sinister flower bed in the backyard of Paul Flores' mother's home. The old detectives in the 90s were incredibly negligent in missing this possible clue to the disappearance of Christine Smart. Unfortunately, no remains of the girl herself were found in the soil. However, the county prosecutor officially stated that there were clear signs of decomposed human flesh in the soil. This was becoming the strongest evidence against Paul Flores as the prime suspect. On February 11, 2021, Paul Flores was arrested by law enforcement. But the reason was not yet the murder charge against Christine Smart, but a violation of gun registration laws. During the search of Flores' home, an unregistered firearm rifle was found. On March 15, 2021, the court issued a search warrant for another house this time belonging to Paul Flores' father named Ruben. And on April 13th of that year, both father and son were arrested at once in the case of Christine Smart's disappearance. 
In the court indictment, Paul Flores was charged with first-degree murder. According to the investigation, after that party 25 years ago, Paul was alone with Christine. There was a quarrel over rejected advances, which escalated into a violent fight. Perhaps hence the injuries on Flores' body, evidence of the girl's desperate resistance. As a result, Paul probably inflicted fatal injuries on Christine. Afterwards, with the help of her father, they buried the corpse in the backyard of her mother's house. Sometime later, the body was apparently exhumed and moved to another as yet unknown location. That's where the alarm clock sound from underground at the mother's house came from. It was Christine Smart's own wristwatch. Ruben Flores was arrested on charges of aiding his son Paul in hiding the girl's body and destroying evidence. In September 2021, the Christine Smart murder case went to trial. Paul and Ruben Flores refused to plead guilty, because of which the process was greatly delayed. But the prosecution was confident in the presence of sufficient evidence for a conviction. Defense attorneys, on the other hand, insisted that all the items seized by the investigation were circumstantial evidence, and there was no direct evidence. Nevertheless, in October 2022, 26 years after Christine Smart's disappearance and a year of intense trial, the jury reached a verdict. They found Paul Flores guilty of aggravated first-degree murder. He now faces 25 years to life in prison. Final sentencing is set for December 2022. As for Paul's father, Ruben Flores, who was charged with aiding and abetting his son and covering up the crime, the jury did not find his guilt conclusively proven. However, the San Luis Obispo County prosecutor has assured that the investigation against Ruben will continue. The investigation intends to get a confession from him and find out where the remains of the unfortunate Christine Smart. The parents of the deceased girl, Denise and Stan Smart, met the jury's decision with relief, although they expressed regret that the body of their daughter has not been found in a quarter of a century. In an open letter, they thanked Chris Lambert and all the caring people who kept law enforcement from hushing up the case for years. The Smarts wrote that without the public's persistence, the perpetrators would have gone unpunished. The disappearance of Christine Smart has not only become one of the most high-profile and confusing cases in California history, it led to the introduction of an important bill into the state's higher education system. The law, called the Christine Smart Campus Safety Act, requires all public colleges and state-funded institutions to enter into agreements with local police departments to investigate student violence in a timely manner. The regulation was unanimously passed by the California legislature and signed into law by Governor Pete Wilson. Law enforcement officials will now be looking much more closely at missing students to prevent a tragedy like that of Christine Sandy Smart from happening again.